We're going to have a packed house here, wow. everyone. Hello, hello. It's so good to see all the smiling, happy faces. Oh, that's amazing. Okay, okay. I'm used to being behind the scenes with uh, PJ and Suzanne when this happens. And yeah, counting the people as they show up, but it's different when you're on this side. Of the yeah, room. yeah. No, and we've got, and I see a couple of my future guests are here today. So I'm honored. It's guests. very exciting. So don't make it look too scary. I promise. Okay. I promise. Okay. Staying centered. Okay. Bear with me. They're still joining. We are doing something a little differently on this call, though. We are going to ask for your questions early in the call. So, because we're going to cover a lot of things, how to join spoken realms, how, what it means going wide, um, the best place to bring your book. We've got some writers that are going to be on this call. So, we want to make sure to get all those questions answered before I go and ask Stephen all the questions about like embarrassing incidents in kindergarten. So right, because we're once we're you, there, it's like you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And we're going to try to get your questions answered. So don't be slow. Right, use the first part of the call after the intro to start typing all your questions in, and um, this is the place to get them answered. And I know people have them because I hear them all the time. I'm going to preface this call with every, I, I don't think Stephen needs an introduction, but the thing that surprised me about Stephen Cohen is I knew he was kind of a modest guy and not waving from the rooftops, you know, how much he actually, actually does. But in the prep for a call, people always send me messages. Oh, so-and-so's coming on. You know, I worked with him. I thought when I first met Stephen, I had worked for the Royal National Institute of the Blind, but I'd never done a book that had gone to Audible. You don't even get to hear your books when you work for that company. So I contacted Stephen and Stephen, um, Sean was responsible for introducing me to Stephen and giving me the guts. And Stephen was wholly 100% responsible for my first book on Audible and for me being in this career today. But I thought I was Stephen's favorite. I thought Stephen just loved me out of the bat because we were simpatico. Every single day since I announced that Stephen was coming on this call, people have been messaging me going, by the way, Stephen and I are really close. He's kind of been mentoring me and I'm his favorite. So Stephen evidently has quite a lot of favorites to the point that I think he's single-handedly responsible for us all being narrators. To be honest, I'm not exaggerating, Stephen. You're, you. I don't know how you find the time, and I'm, why you're um, not coaching. Well, that's <laughs> okay. So, no, that's a good question to start with because I I get that a lot. Um, yeah. I get you know, do you coach? You know, can I schedule a session? And um, I'm much more a fan of the mentorship model because I feel like when I talk with you, even if technically I have more information than you, I don't have your perspective. So we talk, we bounce things back and forth. You say something unique that I never thought of in that way, which then, so I learn as much from that kind of an exchange as I feel like the information that I'm imparting as I'm helping you avoid an obstacle, something that's coming up, coming up in the road. And um, the coaching model just doesn't really feel to me like it works in that same way I much rather try to figure out a way that we're, you know, that we're both, that we're both kind of elevating something in that moment. It just feels more organic to me. I think maybe, do you think being an actor has something to do with that? The lifting each other up and the... Uh, oh, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's kind of like that. Um, you know, it's like if you're doing improv or you're doing comedy and you realize something isn't working and you, tr and you try to jump in in order to make... Yeah, it, it's that here we are. And... But, you know, what works against that is in many different places that aren't audiobooks, there seems to be a lot more of an adversarial relationship between actors. And um, I don't really find that as much here, you know. Um, so I, I feel like I feel freed up 
to just try to help everyone. You know, it's like my goal at the end of the day is to help good people do good work, right? And I think if I had to boil down to one sentence, uh, the essence of what I'm trying to do, no matter what it is, it's help good people do good work. And, um, you know, I feel like the the structure of coaching in that way, which is different from, you know, being invited somewhere and, and running a class, that's different from let's set aside time and have these paid sessions and here's the thing you're trying to get out of it. Um, it's just not a model that really works for me at the end of the day. Well, I think your goal, helping people do good work, if, if the messages and the amount of loyalty coming from people ahead of this call is anything to go by, you've succeeded because everyone feels empowered. You made me feel like I was a really good narrator out of the gate. And that feeling's never left, even on my bad days, because of, because of you, literally, because of my first book, I could have had an entirely different experience, you know, and many have. Right. So. Right. So yeah, it makes a big, big difference. I, I just need, I, I don't know, because you're humble about it and you don't scream it from the rooftops and I'm sure people say thank you. I just thought, I'm not sure if you realize exactly what an impact you've had. The amount of people has been a, quite extraordinary, more than any call I've had and I've been doing this a year now. Wow. And they've been begging to have you on for almost the whole year. So right. Right. we've got the questions coming in. Okay. Um, should I start with the questions or do you want to start with the background about spoken realms first or? Well, if I start with the background and maybe even do the presentation, we may actually have wound up answering some, answering of, the questions some of the questions. Way. That's a good idea. Right. So with um, com compressing the history, but not, but not dismissing it. Um, someone who many of you probably know, his name is Mike Vendetti, was the person who actually got the, the initial distribution contract. But after a long while, at that point, for people to do work in the public domain and get it to Audible, Mike was ready to stop doing that. There's a lot of organizational work on the back end. And I went to Mike and pleaded and said, this is really important. We can't let these things not be there. And I convinced him that I was a reasonable person to like learn what it was he was doing and then automate a lot of it through technology. And like the first time that we used computers to pay people to, to take the, the, the earnings report from Audible and, and automatically pay people, he saw oh, me feed in the report. Sorry, can I stop you yeah. for one second? I don't sure. want to forget this. Yep. You've said the word technology. Big favor, everyone. Please, I don't want to talk about tech like, oh, I've got this problem with second opinion. Can you help me with this? Right. Definitely, it'll take the whole call over. So that it just reminded yeah. me. Sorry, Stephen. Yeah. No, no, thank you. So the first time you saw that happen where we took the report from Audible on what everyone earned and I fed it into the computer and less than a minute later, it spit back out the list of what everybody was owed. He said to me that would have taken me three days. Wow. And that was kind of the difference. And so from that point onward, what I did after that, once I did that piece was I went out to narrators like you, like Kitty, who I see in this call, like some of the other people whose names that I see going by. Um, and I asked, what do you like and don't you like about the options you have now? And honestly, without telling tales out of school, most of the examples people were using in those days were either ACX or B audio. Mm -hmm. And they either liked something about the way they worked or they really didn't. And so I collected that list. And what I built was a system that was very much in response to that. So I wasn't building an anti-ACX or an anti-B. I was more taking these are our likes and these are our dislikes. And I was trying to figure out a way to do things differently. And the initial thing that I did differently is on AC, ACX is essentially match.com for audiobooks. Yeah. Right? You, you make your profile, it's as pretty as it can be, the, you know, the, the rights holder uh, describes their book in the best way they can, you know, loves sailing, loves to cook, you know, those kinds of things, mm -hmm. right? It's there. You put up only the best pictures from the best light, all that kind of stuff. So it really is a dating site. In your headshot from seven years ago. Yeah, exa <laughs> right. Right, exactly. I mean, exactly. friends do that, obviously, I haven't. <laughs> no, 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 but yeah you know so those are the kinds of things you do it's structured like a dating site where you know where you're making that initial connection that way and what always bothered me was 
Um, yep, I totally understand that the rights holders own the IP at the beginning and the narrators don't. But I was seeing the fact that the narrators are the audio experts, especially if it's a rights holder's first book. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to build a system at first where the narrator was the person in the driver's seat because theoretically they're the audio expert on the job. Now, why did this not get in the way of things when you're doing stuff beyond public domain books? Well, do you know the old saying, square peg in a round hole? You know, you, you, you can't, yeah. So what I built was not a system to take it instead of ACX or instead of find a way, but when you've got a square peg project that wouldn't fit in the ACX hole or the find a way hole, you can still do it through, through this system. Um, I've got a presentation where you'll, you, you will all have a link to it at the end because the very last slide has the link to the presentation. So okay. if you find it useful, you'll be able to, to see it. But the basic idea is, well, I can just show you the presentation It'd be better okay. than me describing so it. So I'm going to give you make host. Got it. And I hit the screen share button and I do desktop one. We don't have to share sound. And I come back through. So I'm going to make this full screen and I can just click through it. It's fine. So obviously I've got the book and the microphone talking about how do I become an audio book. I, again, was just trying to do this very simply, you know, happy to help. Let me ask you a few questions. Do you, and here is the reason why I built this. I kept getting rights holders who wanted to understand primarily depending on different situations, how could they make the most money per sale? So that's how this presentation is built. It's built assuming that what, your, the, what the rights holders attempt is that in a $10 sale, I want to retain the most earnings. What do I do? All right. So, you know, so the first question obviously is to ask, do you sell eBooks exclusively on Amazon? You know, being exclusive to Amazon is the best way for me to make money because, of course, the exclusivity, even in the Kindle world, means you get more money per sale. Okay. Well, if that's the case, then the answer is very simple. You choose ACX.com and you choose Audible's exclusive distribution. Why? Because then out of a $10 sale, you're keeping $4, right? At least with the current agreement. Because that's, if we just make the number simple and think a $10 sale, I realize a credit really isn't $10, but, you know, and in a royalty share, that $4 becomes $2 each. But still, that's a very simple, straightforward answer. No matter where you go, you're not going to beat that if your primary place you're trying to sell is anything owned by Amazon Audible. Amazon. Okay. Right? If, if, if the people buy your, your, your ebook there, then nothing beats ACX and anyone who tells you different is trying to sell you something. Okay. All right. So, and that's basically what this is here. This is explaining that out you'll earn the most per sale. You'll be able to choose between either paying for production or royalty share. Then the obvious next question, well, what if I sell eBooks in other places, you know, online in addition to the Amazon Kindle? Like what if my stuff sells on Scribd or I use some other platforms, other kinds of things? What should I think about then? Well, then here's the logical question. Well, are you okay with earning a small, smaller royalty on Amazon Audible? You know, is, are you fine with that? This is the interesting uh, point I'm going to Because uh, counting on the fact that you could be making up for it on sales in your other avenues. Exactly. Because the second you break that exclusivity, you, no matter what choice you make, no matter whose platform you go to, You're you will less. always be less. And here's the reason why. Amazon owns Audible, Audible owns ACX. They are never, ever going to give a different platform a better deal than they give themselves. So no matter how the other platform will describe it, if they would say you get, you know, 70% of the earnings, you know, that earnings is going to be less than the 40% because they will not give away to somebody else more than what they retain on their own platform. That just, that doesn't make sense. They're not going to do that. So the ex, right. So the exclusive option pays the most per sale. Well, now the book is coming back and saying, well, I've looked through the numbers and have decided that it's worth sacrificing the higher payout. So 
Is it, this next logical question, is it important to you that your audiobooks be available on online stores other than Apple, Audible, you know, Apple, Amazon, and Audible? Now, this is an interesting thing, and this is something I want rights holders to think about. Right now, the bulk of audiobooks globally and quite definitively in, in uh, the North American markets, most audiobooks are sold through Amazon Audible and Apple following behind that. Um, if this is where your book, your, your ebook mostly sells, then going wide, you would need another reason why if it's not a, a monetary thing. So let's, you know, so yeah, I've got, a, I've got a loyal following on some other platform. I use Scribd here because Scribd is, you know, at least at the time was the kind of place you could do that. It might be, you know, it might be any of the story-based websites, you know, and I'd like my, my stuff to be in digital format everywhere. Well, then, and this is going to seem weird because again, I'm not from ACX and it sounds like I'm selling ACX here. You should still produce your audiobook at ACX, but choose non-exclusive distribution. And, the re and then, not even take it to me here, once you've got the final audio, take it to find away voices. Now, they will put it in all the other online stores. And here's, here's the thing. Now, many of you know, if you're on the Findaway roster, that if somebody hires you through Findaway, um, they charge the rights holder a fee for them managing you producing the book, whether or not they're strongly involved in the work that you do. If you did it all on your own or if they're helping you out, it doesn't matter. They, they're charging an extra fee on top of your PFH for them managing the project. This is the way to avoid that. Because when the rights holder shows up with the finished audio that you produced through ACX and you did it non-exclusive, so they have the right to sell it everywhere else, find a way just saying, hey, I've got the final audio. It's already gone through ACX non-exclusive. You guys put it everywhere else. In that case, you will be making the most per sale. Now, why is that? This is doing a little bit of find a way history. Find a way's core business is not find a way voices. Find a way voices is an add on. Their core business is moving audio and the related metadata from point A to point B. They actually work for all of the major publishers. Every major publisher at some point in their distribution chain sends their audio through find a way. So what I'm suggesting is that you take care of your, your Amazon Audible stuff directly because you'll get the best deal there. And then do what the big publishers do, drop it in one place to find a way, letting them know that they don't have to go to Audible. In that way, your rights holder will make the most per book in that case, right? Um, so I have a rights holder that produced the first two of a three book series as royalty share yep. a long time ago, um, exclusive. Mm -hmm. And she's asking if she should do the third book as non-exclusive, but it wouldn't do any good. Could, could you still do a box set if you did? Well, there's a couple of things you can do because I had this with an author once. Um, you know, if you, Daniela, are willing to have her buy you out of the rest of your royalty share contract, you can come up with a number that is agreeable to both you and her. Uh, it's best if you call ACX using the support phone number, you'll get much better service that way. And mm -hmm. what they will have you do is they will have you both email saying, yes, it is okay to change the distribution of this book. Oh, it's not even in there yet. Oh, okay. I was thinking your books one and two. Like, yeah, no, we had already done books one and two. She now wants to do book three. We we had put it in right. at one point, but we took oh. it out because we weren't going to do it. Right. I, I was suggesting that if you wanted to, to change books one and two, so you can actually have a package of one, two, and three. Oh, you and could go change wide. them? Yeah. But ACX will require that you agree because the two of you agreed to a seven-year distribution. If you, Daniela, have come to a place where you're going, you know what? She's going to buy out the rest of the contract, you know, how, whatever the number is that, that you think is fair. If she agrees to it, ACX just wants to know that you both agree that it is now okay to change the distribution and they will do that before the seven years are up. The seven years are just to protect you. You can opt out of that protection. Okay. And the typical, yeah, the typical way is you would arrange a direct payment between you and, and, and that author. Okay. Thank you for that. I yeah. digressed. I took you off the, 
No, I, Sorry. I, that's exactly why this is set up this way in order to give information, but then to allow for people to go off in, little, in whatever the tangent is. So why not produce from find away voices? And this is what I was saying to you. If you do that, they'll charge a project management fee. Um, now, it's not a bad thing. If basically, if you're a very prolific writer and you just want to do this once and forget about it, and you don't mind paying that extra fee. And once you've spoken to the people at Findaway who are really nice and you think, you know what, I trust them to manage my project, then do that. Understanding that you will, because of that decision, make less via Audible and make less via Amazon and make less via Apple Books because they will take a cut of all of those earnings before it gets to you. And by doing it the other way, you are avoiding them taking a cut from the three biggest storefronts and they're just taking a cut from the other storefronts that uh, less fingers in the pie is probably the better way to describe that. Um, find a way will take some of your earnings, which is what I was just saying. Producing an ACX, bring it, find a way is what, yep. So all this very clear, very straightforward. Is there ever a time it makes sense? Okay. And this is, this is the thing. They do offer a royalty share option, right? Now their royalty share option is different from the one that's at, uh, that's at ACX. And if you look at those numbers and they work for you, um, absolutely. Um, I've had people ask me why I don't do that through Find Away. And it's purely because if I'm being paid, I need to be paid at, at a union level. And to do that, since the Find Away uh, royalty share is half your usual rate, my yeah. usual rate would have to be double the minimum yeah. in order for it to qualify because they don't have a deal like the royalty share plus on ACX. So I would have to have a, a, a base rate of $500 per finished hour in order to get to 250 at half of that, which yeah. kind of defeats the purpose. Uh, it just seemed like uh, too big of an ask. Um, yep. And then this just explains some of the other pieces about doing it. Uh, they do more earnings. So this is what I was just telling you. So you can see this is pretty straightforward and kind of goes through the whole thing. Authors selling in volume. Okay, here we go. Right. And the kinds of uh, kind of following that have to be willing to use new platforms. So, right. Let me come back here. So often once you start talking about other platforms, you, you'll, you'll wind up with, with a rights holder kind of confused and thinking, well, what do you mean? Well, I'll click through these, but it, th this will make sense. So if you have this sort of reader, if your typical reader is somebody who is willing to respond to you when you say, hey, buy from this platform because this platform is better at supporting the artist, I make more per sale even though it doesn't cost you anymore. If your reader will then go out of the way to support you by going there to that other platform, then going wide is wonderful because then you can use a very small ad buy to reinforce that message to your readers. And then they're likely to follow you to a platform that's got a better deal. And that's what this is kind of explaining here. But that's not very common for writers, is it? Um, it depends. You know, so there's something that there's something called um, de-anonymization. And writers who are, who are very active on social media, whether they're doing this consciously or unconsciously, I, I've, seen, I've seen authors do this. De-anonymization is looking at who you're in, who's interacting with you and then going back and looking at their profiles, looking at the other things they do and realizing, oh, my audience skews female, East Coast, college educated between these ages, right? And so once you've got that kind of information, if you wanted to do, let's say, a, fa a targeted Facebook or Instagram ad, that's the kind of information to make sure that if you're buying a thousand views, instead of somebody who really doesn't match your demographic seeing the ad, the, right. only the people who, right. So if you spend some time looking at your active followings on social media and figuring out what the profile is, you then can use that to do targeted advertising. So that way your, your limited ad buy goes much further and is more effective. Okay. Yeah. So, um, right, this is again, talking about choosing. So here we go. Another question. An example of a non-financial criteria, right? Because this, this I started getting um, as people started getting more upset with Amazon, more upset with ACX for different reasons. Yeah. A yeah. Lot of, there are a lot of people that are in Facebook groups 
are probably going to be watching this recording and very interested right. in this part. Right. And so, yeah, remember, and this is the thing that I was saying, you know, they are still the place where the bulk of audiobooks are sold. So not having your book there takes you out of the, the largest market. You can do it. Focus. And, and one thing, if you ever got to sit down and speak to the big publishers about this, um, the, the point of their advertising is not just to let people know the book is out. The point of their advertising is to try to lure sales away from Audible Amazon because they all make money on other platforms as well. If you buy the book through Audible Amazon, they still make money, but they make much less per sale in the same way. So you're actually starting to behave like the larger publishers if what you're doing is trying to drive them to downpour.com or to audiobooks.com or, or Libro FM, whatever platform happens to offer you the best deal. And that's, that can be a little bit tricky to figure out, but which, once you figure it out, you then start embedding those links into those targeted ads. You know, and so that's what I'm talking about here. Next question from the book. If I just want one place, yep, use Find Away Voices. We already did that. And then this is where we get to the question as to where I come in. And I realize we've spent all this time in here before we even get here. Are the books that can't be? Well, ACX can only be used by people in the United States, Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Also, ACX can only be used by one author and optionally one narrator per project. So basically, that's your round peg, right? Yeah. If you've got something that is not a round peg, like let's say your author lives in France, your author lives in Israel and South Africa, or it, it really is a two-person book, you can't easily do uh, a a two narrator royalty share through ACX um, it, it, because they can't do arbitrary royalty splits and they can't do royalty splits between more than two people. And that's what we're just going through here. So in this case, right, spoken, spoken realms through partner producers, which I used to call featured voices and I'll explain why I've changed can help you out. And this is kind of the point. As long as you, as long as you, the rights holder can have a PayPal account, You can split the payments as needed with two or more people. So if there's more than one author, if you have that where two people got together to write and there's one narrator, I can do that. I can work with three narrators and I work with whatever the combination is. So basically the system I built was to that initial um, friction, yeah. things that can't be done in ACX. Um, there's both a targeted distribution, which is a lot like the, the, um, ACX, the ACX exclusive, and full disclosure makes less per sale, which is why if a project can be done on ACX and the rights holders come to me, I try to send them back there because I don't want to take, I, I want them to make the most money per sale. Um, glo global distribution goes everywhere. And can I, the difference, yeah. Can yeah sorry, um, we're back. getting a lot of questions about something you said like seven yes, slides ago, and I just wanted to clarify because okay. I think I know the answer. Um, okay. when you were talking about the royalty share. Yes, find a way. Stop me if I'm explaining this wrong. Sure. But um, yes, find a way offers royalty share, but they call it voices share. And basically, the, the narrator gets half of their find a way rate. So, so for that to happen, Stephen would have to be paying them the union rate they it, it basically it would have to be the the half would have to be the union rate so the original rate would have to be like 500 Double. something right per my, hour. My, right my my rate on a, on find away would need to be a base rate of 500 and yeah. it, as any of you who are listed to find away know the when when they look through it they sort us by our rate yeah and you can imagine that once you get above 300 and 400 per finished hour people probably aren't really looking at the higher end people as much as they're looking at people further down. So, you know, if my usual rate is 325, half of that is below the union minimum on the platform, which is 250. So I would not be able to count working on that book towards my pension or health care for the year. Yeah. So, and, I mean, so my, my deal with myself is, is, is that I need, anytime I work, it has to be, be has to be helping to um, me keep, keep my health coverage. 
Yeah, well, but Jennifer, for, for in Stephen's case, it's about yeah. meeting union minimums. If you're right. not in a union and yep. you have a normal rate on find away and you're interested in participating in royalty share, you yep. will get half your rate plus whatever. No, yeah, and it's not, it's not a 50-50 split. That's the other thing. And I don't have the details on what it is. You're not getting half of the earnings and half of your half of the share. I do not remember the, what the percentage is, yeah. but I know find the people at Findaway would be happy if you reached out to them saying, hey, could you explain this? Because I'm trying to figure out whether I want to be included in your program that does this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they'll be Sorry. more than so happy I, to explain. I it. pushed you off again, but I, the, oh, a lot no. of those questions were coming up. So I thought we'd right, better... right, right. Yeah, I can't see the questions and the fact that you can, it's great. I you can't, know, it's... but those ones were kind of popping up on the screen. We'll go back and Got check it. for other ones after okay. the presentation. Right. And so in addition to the targeted one, I have a global distribution that in addition to what Findaway would do, which would be to get your digital stuff everywhere, um, it's also, it also includes physical CD distribution as well. And although that's a, that's a smaller version, smaller part of the market, and to be honest, it's getting smaller. Um, there are still physical discs that are, that are sold, that are in libraries, that are in you know places like Cracker Barrel when you're driving down the highway, you see them on the kiosks there, all those kinds of things. The CDs do still exist. And so that's part of the global distribution. That Can we you do. still buy things to play them on though? Yeah, you, you, you actually can, believe it or not, because most DVD players play CDs. So I don't think I haven't had a DVD player in years. I haven't, here. I haven't either, but it, it, it still is a thing. It's just, it's a small, it's a much smaller thing than it was. It's going to be Although, going the way of VHS tapes. Yes. <laughs> yes. And actually I, I'll come back to this when we're talking about something else, because there were some conferences that, that really, in, you know, and actually they're close to you in, in London. Oh. So, yeah, that uh, future book, but I'll come back and mention that with you after. Um, so, right, the size of the royalty is smaller, which is what I was saying. It makes sense. If, if you're trying to do something where you're trying to limit fees, take a look at that. Um, so then here we get to, this is my big question. Feels like it's too much work. This is our, our rights holder going, oh, my God, I just want to pay someone to do it for me. <laughs> right? This is nuts. Right? So, right. Here's the thing. I went out of the way to become a union signatory. I then brought on other people like me who have a lot of audiobook production experience. And we don't produce nearly the number of books per year that any of the publishers or the large publishing houses do. But, you know, it's a, it, it's, you know, it's a couple every month where what we're doing is we're doing full production in-house. And what I mean by that is I mean that you as the narrator get treated the same way you'd be treated if you were hired by Tantor or by Blackstone or by uh, HarperCollins or PRH to record in your own studio where you'd record, you'd send off the audio, we would proof it, send back a list of pickups, get the pickups from you. You've done nothing. We want raw audio. We do, we do not want you to fix it. That is our job. If you spend time de-breathing and de-clicking and de-whatevering your audio, you're taking money out of someone else's pocket, so please don't do it. You know, we, we do that all in-house and then treat the rights holder the same way they would have been treated if their book had been picked up by one of the publishers. And um, I, I'll, I can give you a URL that you can use to figure out what that would cost, but that starts at 325 PFH for the, um, for the rights holder to pay. And we're union signatory, which means that the narrator, and when I say starts at, it goes up based upon the narrator's rate. That's the only variable. Um, and so, so it's, like, it's like the champagne limo service. There you go. Yeah. I like yeah. that. Yeah. You know, or I had somebody say this. I like that. It's like hiring a wedding planner. For, it was great when she said that because um, I was the wedding planner for my wedding. You know, it's like, <laughs> no, no, Sandy was completely overwhelmed. And she was like, I don't know what. So I, me being a stage manager, I found three different caterers, three different places, three different Aww. this. Right, and brought that back <laughs> so she could approve. And it's that kind of an idea. When we cast, we, we do the initial talk with the rights holder. We figure out who we could bring in. And the one thing that we do that other places weren't doing was um, we, we, we take whichever the highest rate, the narrator with the highest rate, and we submit everybody at that rate. 
And the reason why I do that is um, I had a few rights holders who definitely made their choice based upon trying to save a buck. And then later they weren't happy. And so I thought if we could remove that as, as a thing and just have them choose based upon what they really like, then we're going to eliminate that as a problem. And also that's a lesson for the people who are undercharging that they're actually worth more. And I've had that happen with some people doing that as well, where they were making 50 and $75 more PFH than they usually do because they, they didn't feel comfortable asking for that much, but somebody else who submitted did. Um, now, could you repeat that? I didn't see the whole question. I might have to go back to it later, but can you repeat sure. where that service starts at price-wise? 325 per finished hour. Okay. And before the end of this, I will get you the link for that because I don't have that link in here. Basically, I've made a, a calculator where you could put in uh, what the what the uh, what the narrator's rate is and the length of the book and it'll, it'll give you an estimate right there. Okay. So it starts at three twenty five. Um, right. We do the research, do the whole thing, bring it all to you, and yep, totally. If we work with Hall of Fame narrators and Golden Voices, and this is what we were talking about three twenty five PFH. And in, you know what I use is I use ninety three hundred. I know some people use nine thousand, some people use ninety four hundred. 9,300 seems to work more often than not. So a 93,000 word novel would be about 10 hours. Yep. And then here we go. Wait a minute. You said starts at 325. What makes the price change? And this is what I was explaining to you. We're a signatory of the union. And if I were to hire you, Danielle, who is not a, a union member, I still do two things. Um, I still pay you as if you're a union member. And Thank you. If, and if you, have, if you have a social security number, and I, know, and I don't know your citizenship situation, and that's not really to this, but if you I'm had a both. social- I'm both, I'm a hybrid, American and Brit. Well, perfect. So in that case, because you have a social security number, I would still be paying into the union in case you ever joined. So even though you wouldn't have used the healthcare part, so that money I would have paid in and would help float somebody else's health care because you wouldn't be using it. There is money then sitting in the union pension fund um, if you were to ever join. And so any books you did before you join then get connected to you as a narrator. Okay. And they do that by social security number, which isn't great, but it's the only way that it's a number that they can use that they yeah. don't, you know, they wouldn't be keeping in their system. Right. Agreement has a minimum for the narrator, which is what I explained. And, and you know, what makes the change? Right. Narrators with special skills or, or, or experience tend to charge more. And when that goes up, it becomes more than 325. Is there anything else? Right. So here's the other thing. A duet, which is different from a dual narration or a full mm. cast, is... Um, and so to answer what's the difference, a dual narration is chapter one him, chapter two her. You know, or chapter one is the, is, is the criminal, chapter two is the detective going back and forth. A duet is when they're actually responding to each other within a scene. If, if, you, have, if you have the people directly interacting, then you've created a different kind of audio engineering challenge and that can drive up the rate because the amount of work that has to be done um, changes. All right, so... Those are the only things that change it, sound effects and things like that. Again, you're asking the engineer to do more. Uh, things that deviate from the standard, and this is the best line for it. Things that deviate from a standard audiobook add complexity and can, not will, can add cost. And so we come here, we're almost at the end, acx.com, findwayvoices.com, spokenrealms.com, because those are what I talk about here. And here's that link. It's really simple. It's a bit.ly link. Bit dot ly slash make dash audiobooks so if you either want to use this on your own you can just go there or if you want to look at it and you know modify it use whatever but over time if this information changes i promise i will go back and update so that it stays current so we could add this link to our welcome packs so our right, writers can right. look into it. Exactly. Or if you're talking to a writer and you've suddenly figured out that person is actually trying to figure out, well, where would I make the most per sale? You can say, hey, there, and you can see there's no other advertising in here. It's not like I'm trying to pull them away. In fact, like I said, 
I'm really only good for the square peg project. And you will hit one, you know, you'll, you'll have done a, a, a single narration with somebody who's a really good royalty share risk. And suddenly they'll want to do a book with, with more than one narrator and they'll be asking you who's a good narrator to work with, right? Because now you are their audio expert. And that's exactly the situation that I was talking about. And that's a great segue into, um, we've got Why? all the questions. Should we ask the questions about this first and then go into public domain or should Whatever we you want. Let's, let's catch any questions about this so people don't forget them and then we'll go into public domain. So sure. let me just quickly check. Um, what made you decide to require narrators to pitch? Okay, that's public domain. We'll wait for that. Um, okay. okay, everyone just We can take them much. in any order. Well, it's that's all okay. how much we love Stephen Cohen. Mm. So, and that's not helping. Thank you. <laughs> okay, voices share, voices share. We've already answered that. Um, and the price for the full service wedding plan. We got the questions. Yeah, the three twenty-five. Nice. Can you okay. make me the host again, please? Oh, oh! I didn't realize you made. I thought you just made me a co-host. All right. No, I don't know how to do that. So I just. Yeah, I'm. I, I I get it. All right. You were the full so, tortilla. I didn't know. Got it. Okay, now. Okay, okay cool. wonderful. Just in case, just in case, we got more people in the waiting room. I think some people got knocked out. Okay, here we go. So now that everyone is back, let's yep. talk public domain books. As I said, and I hope it's not cheeky. That and by the way, um, we're doing public domain books. Can I tell me if I'm wrong about this? Mm -hmm. Your guiding stick about whether to do public domain books should not be has anyone else ever done it, oh, unless no. the book is the Scarlet Letter. <laughs> Just kidding, but it shouldn't be. It I thought you were going to say Frankenstein. It. I was. I thought you were going to bring up your Frankenstein, which no, I love. I'm the title. killing it with it. Frankenstein. I know. So they, you, I thought you didn't want more Frankenstein competition. No, they can all do it. That big actor did it, and they like <laughs> me better. So you know, and I'm a girl. See, that was my thing. So that was so. You came to me saying, "I'm I'm trying to find something, and I feel very limited by what's there." And I said, "Look, Mary Shelley wrote Frankenstein. Why yeah. don't we hear it in a woman's voice?" You know, and I think you, you have the best cover and I think you sat down and you brought something to it that wasn't there in the original pieces. And I think that's really the point. It's like, why do we keep producing Shakespeare? Why can there be three versions of King Lear going on in the same city at the same time? Well, because there's always something that you can use a, a classic in order to, to say something new. So if something is timely, that's one thing. You know, po politics or the world at large, if something feels timely, do it right? Or, um, or if, if you've been looking through, I am, this is one of my favorite little tricks. If you look through IMDB, you can see production, things that are coming up in the next year, movies that are going to be produced. Well, what if you see a movie that's based on, an, uh, on, on a public domain classic and you're thinking, it looks like that movie is going to be released in March. I can totally have a new version of that book ready like the week before the movie is going to go live. Okay. You know, not a bad way to do those things. And the other thing that's very reliable is looking up books that are in, in the common core curriculum in the U.S., Canada, and in, in the U.K. So books that are part of the public domain that are read by middle schoolers and high schoolers. You know, I realize I'm talking American terms when I say that, but you all know what I mean. K-12 education, the kinds of things that are read in those, you know, in those years if um, those books will have a bump every school year as, you know, the kid who is supposed to read the book realizes, well, realize, they realize they didn't read it. And it's now two days before the test and they had downloaded because it was free, the Kindle version to their phone, but they never got around to reading it. And then that little link says they can click on this and for two ninety nine they can click and hear you read it to them. So I what are you, you going to do? Fail the test or listen to Daniela? Yeah. <laughs> you know yeah yeah i would i would listen right it's, it's, i mean if i was in high school i wouldn't have read anything i would have listened to everything <laughs> right i mean so the for me the the public domain thing was great because the public domain thing allowed um 
when we, when I put the business structure together, I did it in a business incubator. And one thing they talk about is to make your MVP, which in their lingo means minimum viable product. What's the smallest version of your business that you can make to test. And what I liked about the public domain thing was doing a, doing um, a royalty share with Mary Shelley, which is what you're doing when you do mm -hmm. Frankenstein, Mary Shelley doesn't show up for her half of the money. And so she also might, doesn't micromanage me. Right. Well, unless you sat there with a Ouija board, <laughs> you know, you can like, you can, you can see what she thinks of each chapter. Right. Yeah. I mean, you can, you can you channel could. your writer and you're just like, she loves me. Exactly. You know, Everything I'm doing is great. You know, she, she, you, know you, you could have the Ouija board go slow <laughs> down. You know, but, but basically, you know, um, Robert Frost, Mary Shelley, Mark Twain, um, you know, all, all the people who are in the public domain, uh, they, they're not showing up for their half of the, of the earnings. So if instead of thinking of this as you're doing this and giving it away, realize what it is, is you're doing a royalty share where the whole 40% is headed towards you. And these books have a very long tail because that's what made them classics in the first place. Um, and so if it'll, it, it'll sell in a cyclical way, especially if it's one of the ones that's uh, related to schools. Mm -hmm. But that's what it is you're doing. And the other use for it is what you and I had talked about in the beginning, which is you can affect the shape and, and you, can, you can affect what your portfolio looks like. Yeah. You know? So let's say you're primarily getting work in romance. Just the ability to choose some classic romance kind of changes the tenor and tone of what's there while you're still not straying too far from your brand whatever that is, you know. And covers. People don't even think, and I'm sorry, I've got to say, yep. Jim Please. is the only other person. Jim does these covers that are like, the cover is everything these days. And oh, yeah. the cover is half the fun and you get to create the cover. And when you create your, I mean, if you've seen, the, Jim had a cover with like a dragon. I'm horrible with names. And when I'm on a Zoom, my, my mind yeah. goes blank. But that dragon is the yeah. most striking, memorable cover like, you know, and, yeah. and the one he just did for Gatsby, your covers, mm -hmm. your covers can, I think that's why so many people listen to Frankenstein, because the cover wasn't old fashioned -y. I got it from the library. Right. I mean, it really, it felt much more like I was going to go see a play of Frankenstein and that was the, that was the play poster, is really wow. what it felt like. It had that kind of like intensity where I would have expected to see the running date at the bottom of it. I think you really achieved that with that particular cover. I love that. It's the best part. It, okay, yeah. obviously the narrating, but it's one of the best parts. Yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. So um, yeah. I, th I think that, I mean, so that's what the public domain stuff comes from. I don't, I, I think I went off. I don't well, think what I do you have to do? Because people come to me all the time because. Oh, how do you Okay. Yeah, because they come to me and they're like, how are you doing these books? Got it. And, All right. And I, so here, I'm, I'm going to share a secret. Okay. And I've shared this secret on podcasts before, but still people do it. Um, you, please tell me if I'm wrong. Um, to be a good audiobook narrator, you actually have to read the text that's sitting in front of you. Yes? And if you don't understand something, you need to look it up or check with a source about how to say something or what something means, right? Yeah. All right. So on the Spoken Realms page, there's a, a new narrator's apply link. Okay. And up, and up at the top, it describes what, what your first project's kinds of things could be. And then down in the form on the page, there's something that says, please describe your first project. And I can't tell you the number of times I get really reasonable auditions from people who write into that big box, either Joe Smith has been doing, has been doing voiceover for 23 years and is just now moving into audio, but you know, something like that. Or quite honestly, I'm not really sure what you're asking for in this field. When the answer is right there at the top of the page. Now, in my opinion, now, I've also had people look at the form, get a little confused, and then they went over and sent an email in saying, is this what you want? But I want to make sure before I submit it. That person's an audiobook narrator because they're doing their research. The person who's just barreling through and hoping to, to, get, hoping to get something, or if I, if I force this right now, I'll get what I want. I don't respond to that. Yeah. 
And the reason I don't respond to that is not that it's not me hating on anybody. It really comes down to, I'm again, I tried, I tried to build a platform where the narrator is, is the professional. And if the narrator isn't going to be professional enough to make sure that they're filling out that form properly, then I don't know that I trust letting them loose in a platform that will just really let them push almost anything up into audible. Yeah. So, uh, and you know, so it's pretty clear on the, on, on that form, what it's asking for. But like I said, if somebody gets confused and they ask a question, that's just like doing research and checking a pronunciation. But the number of times I get people filling it all out, they get to that one field and they're stumped and they just put anything in there because it's a required field and they can't hit submit without it. There's a reason they can't hit submit without it. <laughs> right. And they're ignoring that, which says to me, no matter how well they narrate, they aren't really ready for, to take the training wheels off and for them to be in charge of a production if they can't read the form. I get that with the cup of Joe all the time. People ask to join the group. And the first question yeah. of the three questions is, I, get, I swear that I will read all these questions and answer them or I will be ignored and not get into the group. And three or four times a week, somebody just does it without answering right. the question. Right. <laughs> right, exactly, exactly. You know, and, and it wasn't even intended that way. I didn't build it as a honeypot, something to trap people. <laughs> it, um, because it's not only me on the back end. If you ever send email to info at spokenrealms.com, there's four of us who get that email address. Um, you know, if you send to us individually, to Stephen at, to Olivia at, to Giovanna at, to Adriana at, if you send to any of us individually, we get that. But if you send to info, it goes to everybody. And it was actually in talking between ourselves that we were realizing, well, wait a minute, what's this consistent problem we saw? And so we just decided that if, you know, if they really didn't understand the form and didn't take the time, it didn't matter how good the audition was because really we're wearing three hats. The hat we're talking about is the narrator hat but you're also wearing your engineer hat and your director hat every time you're sitting in the booth. And we've got the fourth, we've got the promotional hat. That's a fourth hat out there. And if, you, if, if the narrator is the only one filling out the form, then we've got a problem. At that moment, you need to have that sort of stage manager, director, engineer head going, does all this make sense? And what I'm looking for is somebody who actually can either, either somebody who knows their limitations and they hire that kind of stuff out, or somebody who's really taken the time to learn for themselves and they keep a lot of it in-house. But that's, that's why I've got that. Because one of the complaints about ACX always has been, there's no gatekeeper. Anyone can set up a profile. And um, one thing that all I was trying to do was to, um, to, to, to listen to, you know, if, if the form gets filled out well, then, you know, you take a listen, you sort of see where people are. Often somebody will have misunderstood and they'll, they'll have thought a book is in the public domain, but it's not yet. And I will reach back out to them saying, oh, that's great, except Sarah Plain and Tall is not in the public domain. I know it's an old book, but it's not quite that old yet. You know, have you thought about? And then after having listened, I'll say, what about this one? I'll say you have, you do have to be a self-starter. You cannot be right. a reactive person and do a public domain book because it's not hard to submit the project as a public domain book. But I think some people have a mindset of, I'll just follow the instructions and that's right. fine, but you have to think for yourself because you're the project manager. You do the blurb, you do the cover, you do the voice. It's completely down to you. Right. And you got to do flack files. It's not hard but it's different than ACX. And if you're not paying attention, if you can't fill in the form to get into the site roster, right? how are you going to... Well, that's kind of like having the thing in front of the ride. You have to be at least this tall. <laughs> you know, and I'm like, I'm like, you're not quite there yet. It's not, you know, but I, but I don't reach back out to tell people when that's happened. But if the form is filled out well, but there's a different kind of a problem, then I'm like, okay, this person understood, but they, they misunderstood public domain law. Let me, after listening, going, 
oh, nice YA voice. Well, let me think, what's a good Y? Or, oh, good mystery voice. Hmm, you know, and then I'll make a suggestion back in that case. Um, you know, so that that's the difference there. But full disclosure, there you can do a, a public domain book without me, uh, and you can do it through ACX. But to do that, you have to have published a new edition of the book as an ebook that you then claim as the author. So th there's all this other stuff you have to do in order to get those things done. You would have to, and um, Audible only allows you to do that if you have made your new edition have enough extra value above the regular material. So that might be extra essays or photo, just something else that makes it, why is this version different from all the other versions they current I feel like I'm doing Passover there I'm sorry Jew <laughs> Jewish moment you know why is this book different from all the other books right but you have to add value these days for them to even bother approving it and if they do then you would claim that as if you are the author and you can upload your audio but if really what you want is you're thinking I have two weeks between this book and that book so I've got enough time to record something that's not that long um, I'm going to be meeting you know i'm going to be meeting or reaching out to a whole bunch of casting people a little later this year i'd like something else in my portfolio to kind of balance things out you you can do that i mean basically you don't have to have a dark day in your studio if you don't want to you, because you can that's, be working for yourself those days that's the epiphany i had this yeah. year i said because the way you think of an audiobook when you go in and you're, I don't know if I'm the only one that used to do this, but you're like, you're looking at that deadline and I've got to finish this book and I've got to finish that book and oh my God, I'm late for this book. Or the, But this year I promised myself I was going to do a five day week schedule. And if there's not a project on one of those days, it's mm -hmm. a public domain day. I'm still showing up to work five days a week at least. Right. Um, so can we produce a public domain book without producing the unique ebook on Amazon? Yes, you don't need the ebook on Spoken Realms. Exactly. Oh. So basically, if you do it through us, what happens is when a new version of, let's say, Huckleberry Finn, just to choose one, comes out, they will then make yours one of the many audiobook options on the few approved versions that are there. So you'll be right beside Pat Fraley, Johnny Heller, on all the other versions that are there for Huckleberry Finn. You'll be there as well. And um, what I would say is listen to the ones that have been done recently because tastes change and see if you really feel your voice is unique compared to what's there. If you're bringing a unique point of view and if you're thinking that what you're gonna to bring to this is something very different, it'll sell. Um, in my case, I did the Red Badge of Courage when Mike was still running the company. He, at his suggestion, and what he didn't know is I had just listened to Brian Cranston narrate The Things They Carried by Tim O'Brien, which is about the Vietnam War. And I then picked up the Red Badge of Courage, and suddenly I realized this was a whole book about PTSD. That, you know, you, yeah. you don't, you know, long before PTSD was, was, was a word you'd use. And I would not have picked that up had I not just listened to Brian Cranston do that other book. So I have some wonderful reviews on that take in that book because, you know, I've got him going there and, you know, just living that moment and kind, you know, Realizing that the reason why Henry is talking in the third person is not that it happened to somebody else, but he's talking in third person about things that happened to him, but he can only talk about it if he pretends it was somebody else. Do you see what you did there? Do you see what you did there, though? That is the actor's dream. Right. You intuitively created something of your very own, and public domain right. is the perfect, and you, and you did it. Right, and exactly. It's there now. When I realized that that was how I was going to do it, and I listened to the ones that were out there a little bit and thought, yeah, no one else is doing it this way. Yeah. All right, so let, let's do this. And, you know, to this day, and we're talking about something that I did many years, like seven years ago now, eight years ago. Because it know? transcends the business. Right. It, the, right. Everyone's looking, how can I be unique? How can I do this? And that's all business. Yeah. You transcended it right. by that that thing that I've got oh, yeah. an idea. 
Right. Yeah. And the idea came from an unrelated audiobook that I had just happened to listen to. It was in my mind going, oh my God, I didn't really get how heavy this was. I have friends who work at the VA nearby. So I, I kind of hear those conversations tangentially. And there I was opening it. And it occurred to me, Henry was really talking about himself, but in the third person. You know, and so that, it worked. That's art. That that right there. Right. I'm so, I'm so excited about this because yeah. not just audiobooks, that is yeah. when art is born. Absolutely. That intuitive wow. Right. And so that was the need to create it because yeah. in that moment is it, it made sense. Oh, I love that. I love yeah. that. Because those are the minutes I think we're all chasing. Mm -hmm. And we can say that we want this award or that award, but those minutes. Oh, yeah. You've made some. And that's what I was trying to say. I've never quite gotten it, but just teasingly close enough when you do a cover and you have an idea of the story and you're lying, oh, yeah. a, you're in bed at night and you're like hearing the voices. I'm not crazy, by the way, but the voices as in the characters. I know. <laughs> I know. I know. But yeah, that. Oh, I love yeah. that. Yeah, exactly. And it's something you'll be proud of forever, isn't it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Somebody just said, how did the author like it? <laughs> well, right. The Red Badge of Courage is in the public domain, and uh, I, I haven't done a seance to find out. But... <laughs> yeah, that's the one thing. You have to pretend the author is there cheering you on. Right, right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. I know. Yeah, Daniela is on fire talking about art. But, I mean, if, if, if you were here when Daniela worked on Frankenstein, you would have seen a lot of that. Because those were the emails I was getting from Daniela during Frankenstein. You I just... loved it. And, the, and yeah. the, the thing I I want to get rid of is when I did it, I only had the courage. I didn't have the courage in mm -hmm. the beginning. I kept kind of sending you emails and you were like, but just do it. But I really wanted to do it despite being scared and not feeling good enough. And I wish that I had not had so much insecurity when I was working on it because I could have... I think if I were doing it now, mm -hmm. I would enjoy the process more, uh, trying a little less hard because yep. the, just doing Ayn Rand was, it was a short book mm -hmm. and I was just gone. It was like the two, I, I can't even remember those two days are gone. Oh yeah. I understand. Yeah. And I, that's I, the I, public I, domain. If I could yeah. just do public domain books, but still pay my mortgage. <laughs> <laughs> right. There you go. There's the dream. <laughs> there is a thing yeah but exactly. they add up you get little yeah. checks you don't expect right and um we and that's another difference um and that's because of how we get paid we get paid once a quarter not once a month i've had that question also come through so um you know so it and so we're coming up on another one now but that takes a little bit for people to get used to and whereas the other options that i mentioned acx and findaway both can pay out once a month based upon how they get things but um more typically in in uh in publishing you get quarterly payments from from your uh through distribution and so i have a more traditional setup on both of the distribution contracts and there's a third one coming up but it's not live yet a third distribution option oh wow yeah yeah we're in the That's middle of exciting. a pivot when will we're we know about of, that um the I, I'm pitching. I'm pitching the pivot change to some people early next month, so early in March. The other distribution is related to that pivot, and it may, you know. So I mentioned so I was going to come yeah, on your I next visit with us. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> um, so I mentioned that there was a conference that I wanted to bring up. So I think so during COVID. I thought, all right, none of us are getting to see each other. We're not going to get to go to any of those events, but a lot of events moved online. Is there anything I can do? Um, is there anything that I can do that's not, um, that I couldn't do in the real world? And there's a book conference in London called Future Book. And it, it is exactly what, I, what, what, I, what it sounds like. Future Book is not about what's going on now. It's about the industry trying to look three to five to seven years out and what they see happening, and what kinds of predictions they're making. And what was really interesting was, it's a five-day conference, and each morning was filled with audiobook, um, audiobook sessions, whereas the afternoons would go up differently, because they're seeing the largest growth 
in audiobooks, in and they're books. trying to figure out what does this mean? What does this mean for how we handle IP? What are we going to do? And they're, they're learning things like the younger the listener, the more likely they want a Netflix model. You know, younger listeners don't want to buy the book. They want to buy into a catalog where they can listen to what they want in that catalog. Yeah. How does this affect earnings? What's that going to do to royalty share? You know, so it was really interesting to be an audiobook producer narrator in the room when you have publishers talking about that. I feel I learned more going to a publisher's conference than I, than I have for a while at an audiobook conference, simply because it was learning how the sausage is made before it gets to the audiobook stage. Yeah. What they're going to be buying, how they're looking at sales, what they're thinking of, are they going to hold on to their rights more tightly? All of that. Yeah. And really it's, yeah. It's the big picture as well, panning out. And, and so we do have another question. Um, yep. Harry wants to know, are spoken realms contracts longer than seven years? What do they look like? Um, so I have, so the contracts do have, have times and dates on them. Um, but remember the reason why you have a seven year contract at ACX is for, is to protect you royalty share wise. Right. Um, so my distribution agreements are technically for longer than that. Um, the, the one that goes through Audible, which is not global, that's a targeted one, um, uh, doesn't specify. The other one specifies a 10-year um, distribution. But in both cases, I have been able to reach out to them and say, the rights holders, because remember, if, if you're royalty share, that ma makes you the owner of the performance. And so you are right. That, my default in my contract is to try to get the narrator to retain the performance copyrights. So that way you have a bargaining chip when you're talking, right? right? I allow you to switch it. If, if you're working with somebody and you know, they've paid you enough and you feel, no, no, this is their performance. I did this as a work for hire. But my default is I think you should be thinking about retaining the copyright to your performance. So in that way, you can then say, okay, I'm representing the performance. You're representing the words you wrote. Let's work together. If we're going to change our distribution from one to the other, it just, it puts you on a more level playing field. Yeah. So that's why that's my, my preference. But in both cases, there's never been an argument about pulling a book down. I only have to give them a reason why. Sometimes the reason is um, we've reworked the book. We've, we've reworked the series. We'd like to pull this and move this from one kind of distribution to the other. We're going to package it in, you know, in a box set and do something different. So there's been all different kinds of things. Both platforms just require a reason. They're not judging the reason. They're collecting mm. reasons as to why people pull books yeah. so they understand more. They're trying to do research. They're not going to forbid you removing it. They just want to know why so that way they have a better idea of what could affect somebody's distribution. So Stephen, yep. all this business stuff has been enlightening and wonderful. <laughs> Tell me uh -oh. I got to sneak one little thing in. Before you can the sneak as many as you want. What was the most exciting moment as a narrator? The most uplifting, like jaw-dropping, exciting moment that you've had? Yeah. Um, I've got an outside the booth one for you as opposed to an inside okay. the booth. I, I, I've, I've got two. I've got an inside the booth one. Let's start with the outside the booth one because the first one that came to mind. My first book for Penguin Random House. It was a wonderful book um, about um, the memoir of a jazz musician who was also an AIDS activist. And um, I got the book and they said, so you're coming in. I, I live northeast of New York City. I'm in the Berkshires. I'm originally from Brooklyn. I can hop, in, uh, hop on a train or hop in my car and be in, in Midtown in three hours. So I'm, I'm considered local. But when they said where they wanted me to record, I was blown away. I recorded that audiobook at Carnegie Hall. Wow. Right, right. Wow. I, yeah, yeah. So, you know, get, you know, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? Get hired by Penguin Random House. You know, it, not intimidating at all. No, no, no. Right. You know, you know, riding the train in. I know just working with Penguin in Random House itself is intimidating. Oh my God. But and I got, I got, so, and Linda Korn was the director on that and she was so wonderful. 
and like, but yeah, you're walking into Carnegie Hall and going up to the, going up to the recording studios and you're realizing the building that you're in and you're realizing the old joke, practice, 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 and you're scared to death because, you know, it's your first book for Penguin they, and here you are on, you know, on what feels like the world's biggest stage with a super wonder, with an incredibly talented engineer who used to work at Symphony Space. And he and I wound up talking about that afterward, where he said, you know, Isaiah Sheffer, who used, you used to work for, recorded the promos for selected shorts on the same microphone that you're working on now. You know, so, he, you know, little freaky moments like that. But um, Linda was just wonderful in that moment. That first day, I was scared to death. But she gave me some notes at the end of the day on what to do and reassured me about the performance. And from that day through the end of the book for the rest of that week, um, it was just an amazing thing. Um, and that, you couldn't that, have planned it, could you? You could yeah. See, we think about all these, I want this goal, that goal. But the best parts, you couldn't oh, yeah. even imagine, huh? Oh, yeah. You know, and that was just like this weird, amazing thing. And, and, and the author, Fred Hirsch, came down and I got to meet him. I'd seen him play when I was at NYU. I'd seen him play wow. at, at clubs in the village. So this very strange, circular thing. That was, that was the wildest one outside the booth. What was um, the other one? So I did a, um, uh, a, um, I, I a multi-narrator book. Uh, early on, it's primarily a Cassandra Campbell book. It's called Sycamore. And there's a bunch of other narrators in there. X.E. Sands, Terry Schnaubelt. Um, I'm forgetting people. But I was the one male narrator in, in that book. And I had one chapter. Uh, basically, there, there, there's a murder and there's all this other stuff. And um, my chapter is a letter from the main character, from, 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 from the victim's father that you know, and so that's why it's this one male voice in this, in this wonderful book with these wonderful women narrating. And I was having the hardest time trying to figure it out. And he, I realized that in the letter, he talks about the fact that he heats with a wood stove. And why was this important? This was important because I, he, he also said he wrote a letter to her every day and didn't mail them. So I kept thinking, what is he doing with all the letters if he didn't mail them? And when it occurred to me that when he decided the letter wasn't good enough, he wasn't stacking them up. It's not like there were a thousand of them in the place. It's that he would throw them into the wood stove to burn them. It was in that moment where I realized where the letters went that I found the character. <laughs> and I was able to record it. And it still is one of my favorite things that I've ever gotten to record. Um, even though it's, you know, like you, you, if you go back and you listen to old things, you're like, oh, my God. That one, even though I am making earlier on mistakes, I was finding that part of the truth of the character. Yeah, and you weren't you, you were him. Right. You know, it's like, where, where are they going? He's throwing them in the stove. He, he writes them, realizes it's not good enough to, sell his, to, to send to his daughter. It doesn't really explain how he actually felt. So he puts them in, they're, they're just kindling for the wood stove at that point because they're not good enough. And that was the moment I got the character. And yeah. that's, that's it. I mean, isn't that it? That's yeah. what we want. Totally. Completely. Yeah. Because none of the, all the other stuff went. And I think every single person on this call is sitting here holding our breath. Because right. we can all talk about like getting this and getting that and doing better and booking jobs. Mm -hmm. But we're not holding our breaths, are we? Right. You know, like, wow. <laughs> you know. Well, Stephen, that was wonderful. Um, you too. One thing, I, one thing I just did. Yes. Um, I put into the oh, chat. I see that. Yeah, that's the other URL if you wanted to know how to figure out the, the rate. Okay. So I, I'll say it in here for people who aren't seeing it. So it's spokenrealms.com slash tracker slash rate hyphen calculator dot php. And if you go there, what you'll see is a little form. And the form actually looks very... I, works very well on a phone and it'll default to the lowest rate it'll take and if you move if you put in how long the book is and you put in what your rate is it'll tell you exactly what uh would be the fee what would what would go to the um you know what the rights holder would be expected to pay in is order this to the have wedding one is this for yep. the wedding one yep. okay yep exactly that's to have an in-house production exactly 
so Stephen, I need from you, please, uh -oh. a word of wisdom that people that are watching this YouTube video in 30, 40 years oh, God. can go by. What last words would you like to leave them with? Um, when we started this, and I, I, and I said that really my basic goal is to help good people do good work. That came from, um, do, you, do you watch TED Talks at all? Yes. All right. So there's, now it's an old TED Talk. It was actually a TEDx, so it's not one of the fancy, fancy ones. It's a guy in front of a whiteboard. It's, it's really an old, it was like a Puget Sound TEDx conference. Um, you don't need the book. You don't need the other things. If you find, his name is Simon Sinek, S-I-N-E-K. Oh, I think I might, have, I might know which yeah. one you're talking about. Too. It's called Starts With Why. And Simon's basic thing is people don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it, not how you do it, right? Most people, everyone can tell you what they do. Hi, I'm an audiobook narrator. Some people can tell you how they do it, right? They can talk you through the tech and everything. But what really differentiates you from the other people is why. And after going through a lot of the stuff that he talks about in that video and actually listening to some of the other material and all, I kind of kept refining my, my why. And what it, it's not just what I do when I'm recording. It's the same thing that's true for everything, right? And so I feel like that's true in my everyday. That I parent that way. I'm trying to help good people do good work. You know, when a friend has a problem, I'm trying to help a good person get through something difficult. For me, it's that one thing. And um, I had a very hard time articulating that or understanding that. But once... Now I've got it, and I, who knows, I may refine it and change it more over time. But having that affords me the ability when I'm trying to think of whether or not I should do something. Should, should I do it this way? Should I, should I sell second opinion instead of giving it away? I mean, that was a big one, you know, those kinds of things. Um, what really feels like it is in line with who I am, having that as a discrete thing that I can think about um, really kind of helps me keep everything real, keeping it real and keeping it together. That's the interesting, because they always say that about diets. Don't think about your what or what you're yeah. doing. Think about why. And I never got that. I'm like, why? Because I want to be skinny and fit into my faux fur. But I've never heard it explained that way. Yeah. That yeah. why is the goal? It's the... Well, when, when people talk about branding they're, and, and, they, and they come up and say, I need three words for my brand. I need a color for my brand. No, those are, that's all wrong. Yeah. What you're trying to do is you're trying to figure out why you're doing this work. And then the other things, those three words, the colors, the, all those things will come from there. Because it comes from inside. Exactly. Because we are the product right? When we're in a room with casting people or we're in a room with, with rights holders, wherever we are, they're hiring you, not the person next to you at the end of the day. And they're making that, that choice, not from the part of their brain that makes conscious things. They have a gut feeling, feels right, right? That's coming, that's coming from a different place in who you are. They're evaluating what they think about you as a person. They're not, they don't care about your, the colors and the words and the whatever. And so, if you can understand that basic core why, what makes, what, what inspires you to do better and bring all the branding in line with that, yeah. then, you know, then it's not, you're, you're not just another VO person who has three words that kind of describe their voice on their website. Yeah. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. That's, this call has been everything. I'm so glad that you joined us. You have truly the soul of an actor and I wish you the very best. And I'm so going to try to get you to come back. <laughs> um, I, I think what you've built here is amazing. Oh, thank you. It's, it's these guys. They're fabulous. I think narrators could conquer the world basically and writers for the writers on the call. We couldn't do it without you. <laughs> <laughs> right. No, absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah, we, there may be an announcement. It depends upon how the next pitch goes. Announcement or not, we'd still love to have you back. I still haven't All gotten right. the scoop on when you were seven. Oh, <laughs> what? 
<laughs> okay, is that next time or is that this time? I don't know. That's next time. I, <laughs> okay. I think okay. I will let you off lightly this time. All right. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much, Stephen. Thank you, everyone, for joining. As always, it's been wonderful. You all look fabulous. Take care, everyone. Be well. Bye, Stephen. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.